This content is not suitable for children and may contain depictions of violence. Grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast. Well, Islanders, this week I bring you an Aussie case and it's really, really nasty. It's disgusting and exploitative where a woman will lose her life at the hands of a serial scumbag. Okay, so tonight I'll reference abc.net.au, some stuff from University of Sydney. News.com.au, The Daily Mail, and images from Channel 9. There's also the usual court and coroner's records. And when I read from those, I will read directly from them. I do edit them just for clarity. First, we've reached our thousand subs. So, woohoo! In the next couple of weeks, I will draw the winner from all those that commented on the 1,000 sub video. So if you haven't yet commented, please do get in there. I'll keep it open for another couple of weeks. Okay, so tonight we go to the outback, to Deniliquin, New South Wales, and it's locally known as Denny. It's a town in the Riverina region of New South Wales, close to the border with Victoria. It's about 700 kilometres southwest of Sydney or about a seven and a half hour drive, depending on how fast you go. Back in the day, it was a real bush ranger territory with the likes of the Kelly gang doing business, so to speak, in the area. Now, I'd like to just say that there will be some derogatory terms mentioned tonight, so it's just a little bit of a warning. Danilikin will be where the initial part of this case will be centred around and the case is the death of Janet Fisicaro, who fell to her death on the 24th of March 2005 at the Royal National Park at Otford, New South Wales. Her husband at the time, Des Campbell, would be suspected of pushing her over the cliff. Now, there is a lot to get through. Janet's background, Des Campbell's background and all the events before and after Janet's death that ultimately brought this case to a close. It's at Deniliquin that on August the 2nd, 1955, that Janet Ann Neander would be born at the Deniliquin Hospital. She was the second of seven children to Len and Val Neander. Now, Janet met Frank Fisicaro, a local potato and sheep farmer and a Vietnam vet in 1979, becoming engaged to him on Christmas Day in 1980. They were married on the 13th of May 1982 when she was aged 26 years. At the time of her marriage, she moved from the Neander family home to their property known as Hillview. Now, that was about a 10-minute drive out of Deniliquin Township. Now, Frank and Janet had their one and only son, Stephen, who was born in July 1983. Now, sadly, Frank died suddenly from a heart attack on the family property on the 30th of October 1997. Now, after Frank's death, Janet moved back into town and stayed with family members. The property known as Hillview was placed on the market and sold, and Janet purchased a house at 101 Macaulay Street, Deniliquin. Now, Janet led a very full life had a love of visiting family and friends, enjoyed her work and enjoyed socialising at the local RSL club, that's Return Services League, with with her friends and family. She came from a very close-knit family whose members appear to have been pretty affectionate towards each other. They kept each other informed about events going on in their lives and they offered each other support, guidance and advice in times of need. Now, Janet was employed at the Deniliquin Hospital as well as the Community Health Centre as a domestic in the catering and housekeeping department. Now, this bit is, next bit is a little bit nasty, but it's important to understand the whole story of what is to go on. Okay, Janet was described by some as simple and of being below average intelligence, a little bit slow. She didn't play sport, participate in any exercise activities or like camping. And she had a fear of heights and she hated the dark. Now, Frank left the gross estate at that time, including the property known as Hillview, 
with an estimated value of $664,000, together with further interest in a jointly owned property known as Sand Hills. And he had a bank account with St George Bank Limited, with Janet being the other joint owner of those assets. And Sand Hills, by the way, was the original name of Daniloquin. Those further assets was worth around $87,000, other than a sum of $10,000 left to Frank's sister, Camilla. So Janet became the sole beneficiary of all those assets. In country towns, well, anywhere I suppose, gossip gets around, people know each other's business, and Janet was known as a very wealthy widow. Now this is where we will meet, and Janet will meet Desmond, or Des Campbell. He was born on the 21st of November, 1957. He enlisted in the Australian Army on the 12th of March 1980 and was discharged, having resigned, on the 29th of January 1985. We have a bit to go through here in relation to this Des Campbell character. Most of it's not good and I'll be reading a lot of it directly from the coroner's transcript. Again, changed and edited just for, just for flow. Now, in the Army, he achieved the rank of Second Lieutenant. During the course of his training with the army, he undertook a basic parachute course. He reckoned that he was the commander of a platoon of 33 paratroopers and a member of that paratrooper team whilst doing service with the army. On the 19th of August, 85, Mr. Campbell was sworn in as a police officer with the Victorian Police Force. He was promoted to the rank of senior constable on the 20th of December, 1990, and resigned from the Victorian Police Force in November of 1994. By that date, Campbell had been married twice, with his second marriage being to Gwendolyn Collin, a fellow police officer, and there was one child from his first marriage. Now, Campbell had been suspended without pay in November 1994, and according to his police records, Campbell had travelled overseas extensively during 1989 through to 1992. Countries and cities visited included Hong Kong and England, Manila and Los Angeles. Whilst a member of the Victorian Police Force, a number of disciplinary allegations were made against Des Campbell. Now, after leaving the Vicky, Victorian Police Force, Campbell gave interviews to a journalist associated with the Herald Sun. Now, Campbell described how racism, corruption, bashing victims, fabricating charges, planning drugs on suspects and other corrupt activity was allegedly a common practice in the Victorian drug squad. In a second publication dated the 18th of June 2000, Campbell told how violence and the fabrication of evidence was everyday events. Campbell then moved to England and was employed by the Surrey police on the 5th of June 1995 notwithstanding the fact that there had been disciplinary charges which had been laid against him by the Victorian police. And he ended up resigning from the Surrey police on the 1st of July 1998, prior to a disciplinary hearing against him commencing at the behest of the Surrey police. So he's a bit of a crooked cop. Whilst he was a member of the British Police Service, he again became a subject of disciplinary proceedings as a result of amongst other things, an allegation of indecent assault being made against him by the victim, who was then a young woman who met the police constable Campbell when he attended a domestic in incident that the female was involved in. This meeting resolved, resulted in the victim and, the, and Campbell meeting a few days later. Now, during the course of that meeting, the victim alleges that she was the subject of a sexual assault perpetrated by Campbell. Now, as a result of that incident, Campbell was suspended from work, arrested and interviewed about the allegation. The case was submitted to the Crown Prosecution Service who decided that there was insufficient evidence to proceed as there was no corroborative evidence. The victim, it seems, refused to allow her parents to be interviewed, and that made it impossible for the authorities to obtain any evidence of an early complaint. What a load of fucking bullshit. Anyway, during the course of that investigation, other matters emerged. There was evidence to suggest that he had committed a number of disciplinary offences and he was served with notices in relation to 15 breaches of police disciplinary regulations. 
Now, Chief Superintendent Kevin Dinas of the Surrey Police monitored Campbell's work. This led to him having continuing concerns regarding Campbell's attitude and behaviour. He became aware that Campbell had been involved with several women, including the wife of a fellow police officer who was also stationed at the same police station as Campbell. Now, this led to a situation between the two officers deteriorating to such an extent that the chief superintendent was forced to change the duties of the police officers to avoid any trouble within the police station. That's You don't want to go to work and have to be doing that. So, you know, don't fish off your own company dock. Also, during the process of checking Campbell's work, it became apparent to the chief superintendent that Campbell was targeting females. In addition to his concern that Campbell was targeting not only females, but lonely, lonely and vulnerable females, several other constables came to the chief superintendent with their concerns regarding his attitude and professionalism. This led to the chief superintendent deciding to conduct a formal investigation into Campbell in order to confirm or refute his then serious concerns. It was within days of having made such a decision that the information was received by the chief superintendent relating to the female member of the public who wanted to make the serious complaint against police constable Campbell. So that was the sexual assault allegation. Now it was this complaint which related to the incident of that sexual assault which she alleged was perpetrated upon her by Campbell and which led to his later arrest. Now, throughout his period of time as police constable, Chief in Superintendent Dinas found him to be an officer with very few friends and not respected by his colleagues, who made it clear that they didn't want to work with him. His attitude upset members of the public, and often his attitude was a catalyst which sparked minor breaches of public order law. On that basis, the Chief Superintendent determined to take steps to have Campbell removed from the Surrey Police Station. Oh, police service, sorry. But before he could sack him, Campbell resigned. Again, he resigned before he got the sack. And Campbell ended up back in Australia and he got a job with the Ambos. So not only does his workmates hate him, but everyone in the street hates him as well. Anyway, let's move on. Now the Ambulance Service of New South Wales records indicate that Campbell commenced his service with the Ambulance Service in January 1999. He would serve in several locations and in June 2003 until December 2004 was transferred to Daniloquin. In December 2004, he transferred to Helensburg, holding the rank of Grade 2 Ambulance Officer Year 4 with a qualification level of 3C. Now, this, this Campbell sounds like a real asshole. He's got no friends, workmates don't like him and don't want to work with him. He targets lonely and vulnerable females and assaults them. And it looks like he also has financial troubles. As a cop, it looks like he's a real prick, getting suspended and having to resign. When he did leave the Victorian police force, he was happy to tell the media how corrupt they were, as I mentioned before. Now, while working as an ambo in Daniloquin, Campbell would meet Janet Fisicaro, probably while she was working at the hospital. Now, we know this because Janet confided in Diane Rinaldi, a, co a co-worker, that she was seeing a man and that that man was Desmond Campbell. Now, Diane Rinaldi tried to warn Janet of Desmond Campbell. Others who found out about her relationship also tried to warn her. So it looks like Campbell's reputation had got around town. Now, Janet kept this relationship on the quiet not letting her family members and even Stephen, her son, know about it. Now, I suspect this was because Campbell wanted it kept secretive rather than Janet wanted to, and that's for a variety of reasons. First, Campbell would be seeing other women. Secondly, he was trying to get money out of Janet. And third, he didn't find Janet particularly attractive. Now, before we get into some of the women that Campbell was seeing while in a relationship with Janet, we need to go over a few of the things that went on between them. Now, there is this little nasty bit here. So, first, when his boss at work congratulated him on his engagement to Janet, Campbell said, now, just, this is what he said, I don't like saying it, but this is what he said. 
She's a fat, ugly slut that she was chasing him, text, texting him, phoning him, that he was sick of it. He was going to, if she kept it up, take out an AVO against her, kick her up the ass and tell her to fuck off. Now, that's a pretty nasty thing to say. And this wasn't the only person he would tell that he wasn't involved with Janet or speak about her in, with these sort of derogatory terms. Now, him telling people he's not going to get married or anything, doesn't want anything to do with her, it's not, not true at all. Because they ended up getting married in Echuca, Victoria on the 17th of September 2004. Now, no guests were present at the wedding at Campbell's request and the celebrant arranged two witnesses to attend the ceremony. Now, Janet didn't even tell her family or her son about this wedding. Now, Janet has this property in Daniloquin, and she would put it up to sale to buy a place that Campbell wanted at 49 Station Street, Otford, near where he's working at Helensburg. The Daniloquin place would sell in November 2004 for $269,000. Now, the Otford property was purchased for $660,000. Now, Janet paid a holding deposit of $1,600 odd dollars, the balance of that deposit of $64,000 odd dollars, and stamp duty of $25,000. Then later in February 2005, she paid $50,000 to reduce what was owing on the mortgage over the Otford residence. So Campbell wasn't putting any of his own money into it, not that he had any, and he did try to get Janet to put it in her name, telling her that he could claim relocation money from the ambulance service for a majority of the stamp duty paid on the house. Apparently, he wasn't actually entitled to this because he hadn't met certain criteria. But he appealed the decision of this application and he was given $19,333. Now, he should have paid that back money back to Janet, but he kept it to pay some of his own debts. In fact, let's go through some of the financial transactions between Janet and Campbell. On the 1st of April 2004, Janet withdrew $2,500 from her account and stuck it in Campbell's account. On the 7th of June 2004, Janet withdrew $23,000 from an investment account and stuck it in Campbell's account. She told her financial advisor that the money was to repay a loan on a property at Castle Main where Campbell's parents lived. She said the property was in Campbell's name. Now there was no such property and there was no such loan. In fact, Campbell's parents didn't receive any money at all. The funds were used to reduce credit card debts owed by Campbell. Upon the sale of Janet's house in Daniloquin, the proceeds went directly into Campbell's account. He used approximately $25,000 of that money to pay back other debts he had. On the 22nd of October 2004, Janet and Campbell signed a National Bank loan application. Campbell listed his assets as $2,100 in a car. And Janet's assets were listed as a home valued at $280,000, a $250,000 investment account and a car. The ambulance service, well, they reimbursed $19,333 for the stamp duty, which I mentioned before. And on 4th of January 2005, Campbell purchased a motorbike and transferred $3,500 from his account by way of internet transfer. On the same day, there was another internet transfer of $5,000. And this, of course, is money from Janet's house sale. So it's not really his money, it's just in his account. Throughout April and May 2005, Campbell withdrew an amount totaling $70,000 from the joint mortgage account held by him and Janet and placed part of the money in his own bank account and he used it to pay off his credit cards. So this is after Janet's death and we will get up to what happened to her. Campbell received by way of benefits from his relationship with Janet both before and after her death about an amount totaling $325,000. Now, if this doesn't include a benefit that he would get from selling the place at Otford, all up, he would have a benefit of about half a million dollars. Now, say he divorced Janet in March 2005. After the settlement, he might get, say, $20,000. So between $500,000 and $20,000, you can see 
there'd be a bit of a motivation to get rid of her some other way. Anyway, we got sidetracked there a bit. Let's go back to some of the women Campbell was involved with. Now, the first one he was with, which I'll tell you about, was before Janet, but what he does to her is so relevant that we'll go through what he did to her first up. Now, in my audio podcast, I did go into a little, a tiny little bit more detail in here, but I'll just condense it for a bit more clarity. Now, this was Miss Ingham. Now, Campbell met Miss Ingham while in England in 97. She would visit him twice in Australia in 99 and then 2000. Then in 2001, Miss Ingham was speaking to Campbell about a property settlement from a previous marriage. Now, Campbell had been telling her that he wanted to marry her and that he... <laughs> and you can imagine what he was thinking when she started telling him about property settlements. Anyway, she went back to Australia for a third time to come visit him. In April 2001, Miss Ingham was picked up by Campbell from Melbourne Airport. She thought she was going to spend the rest of her life with this guy. Now, later that night, Campbell became very angry when Miss Ingham told him how much money she'd actually got from this property settlement. And it was only £28,000. Now... Campbell was pissed off. He thought it was going to be a lot more money. He thought it might be hundred grand or more. Now, he ended up calling her a fucking liar and a slag. Now, Campbell didn't speak to her for the rest of the evening. And the next day, he drove her from the hotel and dumped her back at the airport. Now, as people who are abusive like this always do, the next day he apologised. He went to pick her up from the hotel and told her how he wanted a sports car. <laughs> And guess what? She went and bought him a, a Lotus Esprit after getting abused. Oh, yeah, you, oh, darling, he must have thought, she's got $28,000. I should be able to get, or oh, £28,000. I should be able to get a sports car out of her. So, for, <laughs> she paid for the sports car using the money from her property settlement. Now, it cost $63,000. Now, C Campbell actually put in $5,700 by way a credit card to help pay for the car. Now get this, Miss Ingham told Campbell, oh, I'll pay you back that money. And she did, she paid him back that money he paid on the credit card for his sports car. Plus she gave him an extra 1,000 odd dollars pocket money. I mean, what the fuck? Anyway, a month later he sells the car for $60,000, tells her he got 50,000 for it and sticks the money in his bank. Now, he tells her that they should buy a house together and he should, she should put it in, in his name because she's not a resident. So Miss Ingham found a house, which she agreed to buy in June 2001, for $150,000. Now, Campbell used some of the money from the car as a deposit and he got a home own, first home owner's bonus from the government and that was $7,000. Then Miss Ingham travelled to England, back home, to pack up all her shit, say goodbye to her family, and send it over to Australia. She shipped all her stuff to Australia. She was still in England. And then Campbell started to ghost her. Then in February 2002, she, re she received a text message which said, I'm sorry, but I'm moving to live with ex-wife and Jess. We'll sell house and send you money. Post me a dress for your things to be sent to. I've made up my mind to do this. And he sold the house. He sold the house for $150,000. Now, Miss Ingham sought to recover about $40,000 that she thought she was owed from Campbell after all this bullshit. Now, Campbell also said he was going to post the things back, but no, he didn't. He didn't send anything back other than a small photo album. And after paying the back, bank back what was owed on the house, Campbell received about $22,600 odd dollars. Miss Ingham settled her proceedings against Campbell for about $9,000. So there you go, fuck. Now that was before Janet came on the scene. But I think it is relevant in the whole scheme of what a kind of asshole this Campbell is. Now we'll get to the next woman, Miss V. I'll call her Miss V Velikansky, but I can't say it every time. Miss V, in 2003, received an email from Campbell on the website udate.com. Around September 2003, Campbell went with Miss V and stayed a couple of nights at Budgie Boy. Budgie Boy, what a name. And on to Sydney. They fought and subsequently Campbell sent a card and a teddy bear to Miss V and asked to continue the relationship. So there you go. They go out, they have a big argument. He gets pissed off. Next day he's thinking, oh shit, I better send a teddy bear or some shit to her. 
In December 2003, Miss V flew to Albury and stayed in Daniloquin with Campbell for two or three days. In February 2004, Campbell drove to Budgie Woy to stay with Miss V for approximately two weeks. Both in Daniloquin and in Budgie Woy, Miss V had a sexual relationship with Campbell. All this time, he's with Janet, planning to get married. Between February and April 2004, Miss V went and saw Campbell in Aubrey, and they had an argument, <laughs> another argument, so she returned to Sydney. Now, Campbell told her that he'd bought a house in Otford for $660,000 and was going to move into it in February of 2005. He later asked if she would trust him and go away with him for a few weeks without asking any question. That is a bit of a <laughs> red flag, everybody. So people are saying that to you, red flag, watch out, maybe you should move on, but nah. Anyway, Miss V went to the Otford residence on, in December 2004. After being asked by a neighbour, Mr Wilmot, if she was Janet, she later asked Campbell who Janet was. He said she was a friend of his who came with her boyfriend to look at the house. Now, Miss V went to see Campbell in Offord again in February 2005 and up to the 16th of March, so several days in March and up to the 16th of March 2005. Now, that's not long before Janet dies. In March, while Miss V was at the Otford residence, Campbell said that a friend was coming from Tamworth to go camping with him. He said that he was going to do an ambulance service course in Goulburn for six weeks, so Miss V would not be able to contact him, which was total bullshit, as you know. If anyone's going to say, hey, darling, I've got to go on this course somewhere for a few weeks. Oh, you won't be able to contact me for six weeks. It just look, it's bullshit. OK, red flag. There's red flags everywhere in this. Anyway, he said that he's not going to be able to contact her. Total bullshit. And she ended up leaving the offered residence a week before Janet's death. Then there's Miss Aldred. Miss Aldred met Campbell in October 2002 on a dating website, RSVP and Udate. Campbell stayed at Miss, Ace, Miss Aldred's home in Sutherland a couple of weeks later and they had intermittent contact via email and phone. Now, sometimes, sometime around the end of 2004, Miss Aldred visited Campbell at the Offord residence for two or three days. So, he's <laughs> the Offord residence, the one Janet's paid for, this is the second woman he's had in there. She also stayed with Campbell for three days, somewhere around March 2005, in between when Miss V was staying there. Now, while staying at the Offord residence, she went and collected a parcel from the post office for Campbell, and on the back of that parcel, it said, from Janet. Now, on each occasion she met Campbell, they had a sexual relationship, and he wouldn't tell her who Janet was. Then there's Miss Linda Rogers. In May 2004, Miss Rogers re-established contact with Campbell, a former boyfriend. Miss Rogers visited Campbell in Berrigan a few weeks after first making contact. She stayed the weekend with Campbell and they had sex. Campbell asked her to stay with him and leave her husband. God, fuck. In, in June school holidays of 2004, Miss Rogers visited Campbell at Daniloquin and stayed for four nights. They also met up in Melbourne. Now, on that occasion, Campbell spent more than $1,000 on dinner and drinks, but it obviously wasn't his money, but spent plenty of dough. Now, in October, they ceased to have contact, as Campbell told Miss Rogers that, guess what? <laughs> you asked too many questions, you've got to go. Now, they'd been emailing and telephoning frequently from May to October. He's with Janet at this time and the other women as well. Okay, so you can see from the time and dates that Campbell was not committed to be in this monogamous relationship with Janet. The women he was with, well, he was only interested in what they could do for him financially and or sexually. And if he didn't get his way, it would become abusive and then next day make up. Campbell would be described by Janet's family as a gold digger and a rogue. Now, I wouldn't call him a rogue, as you know, I call him a fuckwit. Okay, from now we have the background to this story. Let's get into the, what this case is all about. He'd purchased an EPIRB emergency beacon on the 23rd of February 2005 from Dick Smith at Moore Park. 
Now, Campbell told police that he took the EPIRB on the day because when he first moved to Otford, he went for a walk along the cliff track along the bottom of the escarpment and thought it was really hairy. The next week, he had seen EPIRBs on sale. Now, Campbell and Janet drove to the Otford Lookout car park and arrived at about lunchtime. This is the 24th of March. They walked from the Otford Lookout along the cliff top track until they came to the junction with the coastal track. They followed the coastal track down through the Palm Jungle until they came to the general vicinity of the figure eight pool. At around 2 p.m., they set up their tent near some small trees where there wasn't too much grass and a small clearing. You can see by the photos from Channel 9, which I'll put up now, that it's a really dangerous and shitty place to camp. Now, this wasn't a designated camping site. In fact, there were signs saying no camping and advising that a camping permit was needed. Now, Campbell didn't have a permit and there were camping areas at North Era Beach, Ulula Falls and at a trial location at what's now known as Guatemala. So that's not too far away. In fact, no one would want to camp there as it was on this slope and it was rocky and uncomfortable, as you can see by those photos. At the campsite, they ate food, drank tea and coffee, had a small amount of Baileys and lay around the tent. Now, according to Campbell, at around 7pm after sunset, Janet got up and said she was going to the toilet. Now, as she walked off without a torch, Campbell told her don't go in that direction as he'd already taken a dump over there. Then at about, at about 15 seconds later, he heard a sound like, ooh. He yelled out, what the fuck are you done? And there was no reply. So Campbell then said he got out and had a look around but couldn't see Janet. He then grabbed his backpack and found his way to the bottom of the cliff. He found Janet at the bottom of the cliff adjacent to their campsite. Now she was in a sitting position a short distance from the bottom of the cliff. A lot of blood splatter was on the rocks a number of metres from Janet towards the cliff face. Now Campbell pulled Janet's body up onto a flat rock and checked her pulse. He performed CPR, or he fucking reckons he did, but he knew she was dead. She was bleeding from the head and one eye was closed. This was about a 50 metre drop. Now Campbell said there was a huge swell, which meant he had to drag Janet onto higher rocks so she wouldn't be swept away. He said she was pretty heavy and it was difficult. He put his jacket over her and set off his EPIRB sometime before 8pm. So the EPIRB was actually first detected by a satellite beacon between 7.25 and 7.35 p.m. A rescue helicopter was dispatched and arrived just before 10 p.m. at the location in Offord. See, they thought this was coming from the water, but it was actually on the beach. Now, when the paramedic was winched down from the helicopter, he could see Janet wedged between some rocks in amongst the waves so he couldn't attempt a retrieval. He saw Campbell standing on some rocks a few feet away. So Campbell was winched into the helicopter and flown to St George Hospital and a second helicopter rescue mission retrieved Janet's body. An autopsy would show that Janet had a 0.02 level of alcohol in her bloodstream and no other drugs that would cause her impairment. So probably that taste of Bailey's, that's all she had in her. Now Campbell looked in shock and at times was crying according to police, rescue staff and hospital workers. When investigators checked out the area where Janet had fallen from, they found it was steep before the cliff edge, now steep like the roof of a house. It was rocky so you could easily trip. They found footprints belonging to Janet and blood and human tissue were at several points down the cliff. So, at first this wasn't a criminal investigation, but as time went on, suspicions arose that maybe Campbell pushed Janet over the cliff. On the 26th of March, less than two days after Janet fell over the cliff and died, Campbell was texting his old flame, Miss V, with the intent of hooking up, and the next day he went to Harvey World Travel inquiring about a trip for two to Asia. Now, Miss V was asked if she had a passport and wanted to fly out for a holiday, but she said she could only take a few days off. So Campbell booked a trip to Townsville instead for the two of them, telling the agent he would be travelling with his wife. That's that photo of him spreading his legs on the, on the beach chair. On the 27th of March 2005 at 8.20pm, a call was made from Janet's mobile to vote on the show X Factor. So, a couple of days after his wife dies, he's back, <laughs> laying back watching te telly, 
sees the X Factor, he's got her old phone, he's going to use it to vote on the X Factor. That's how much grieving he was doing. He's such a sad guy. On the 31st of March, Neil, this is Campbell's brother, he found out about Janet's death when he received messages of condolence on his phone. Now, his phone he had used to belong to Campbell. And obviously, when he was using Janet's phone, probably a better phone, he gave that one to his brother. So his, his brother's getting all these messages of condolence on it. Now, after reading these messages, he went on the internet and found out about her death. So his brother hasn't told him anything about his wife's death. On the 1st of April... 2005, Campbell and Miss V went away on their trip to Townsville. In Townsville, they went to bars, restaurants, beach, and car trips and to lookouts, and they had sex during this time. But guess what? They had a fight, and on the 4th of April, April, Campbell just packed his bags and fucked off back home. On the 5th of April, 2005, Campbell made a payment to the dating site RSVP to hook up with other profiles. Now, he had an old RSVP account, that was using Janet's money to reactivate it. And he communicated with several other people on there or several other women on there. Okay, so Janet's funeral was on the 5th of April. And guess what? Campbell didn't go. He couldn't be fucked. He just didn't go. He didn't go to her funeral. I suppose he didn't want to see the family. I, <laughs> who knows? But he didn't go. On the 10th of April, 2005, Miss V went to Campbell's house in Oxford to drop off the prezzies that she'd bought for him in Townsville, but he probably didn't take back when he fucked off back home after the argument. But Campbell told her he had a singles party that night, but to wait for him at the house. Now, when he arrived at the Oxford residence that night, he proposed to her and asked her to move in with him. Miss V stayed for a few weeks at this Oxford residence, now, she saw no female clothes or toiletries or any sign that anyone else had recently lived there, even though Janet, who just died, had been living there. She once discovered a rates notice, though, with the names Des and Janet Campbell, as well as a wedding card. Now, Campbell saw her reading the card. He got pissed off and started yelling at her. But red flags everywhere. Campbell convinced her that he wasn't married and told her that if the police ever contacted her, she should deny knowing him. What sort of person do you want to get mixed up with if they say, oh, the cops come around? That just deny knowing me. I mean, you just don't want the cops coming around anyway, let alone, oh, don't, don't tell them about me and what you're getting up to. Fuck's sake. This is just red flag territory every fucking way. Anyway. Then the neighbour noticed Campbell burning shit in the backyard. Now, I reckon this was Janet's belongings because no matter how hard the family tried to get her stuff back, Campbell refused. They ended up getting a small box of her stuff via a solicitor and when they did turn up to the house, he closed all the blinds, locked all the doors, the cops came and the cops were able to get the keys to her car. That, that's all they got. Now, in the month after Janet's death, Campbell was in contact with these several women. It was Miss V, Miss R, Miss Rogers, and Miss A, Miss Aldred. Then on the April the 20th, he went to a real estate agency to sell the house. Now, he did sell it, and he got $100,000 less than Janet paid for it. Remember, it was $660,000. Now, this was actually part of her estate at this time, and it was her estate was to go mostly to her son. But as I said before, he transferred a lot of the funds into his own bank account. Now, because Janet had ploughed so much money into the house already, he just wanted a quick sale, so took the first lowball offer, knowing once the bank got their cut, he'd have about 100 grand or so left over for himself. Now, this guy is a real prick. By August, police would search his house, though. On his computer, there were plenty of photos of family and friends, all that sort of stuff, but not one of Janet. There would be an inquiry into Janet's death and it would be found that Janet was pushed. She didn't stumble over the edge in the dark. Now, the footprints at the edge were shown to be not from someone walking and then sort of tripping and sliding over the edge, but from someone who's being forced over the cliff and was sort of desperately <laughs> trying to resist. So eventually, there would be enough evidence to charge Des Campbell over the death of Janice, Janet Fisicaro. And I'll use that name rather than Campbell. 
In May 2010, Des Campbell would be found guilty of murdering Janet and he was sentenced to 33 years behind bars with a non-parole period of 24 years. Now, Justice Megan Lathan said that his wife of six months, Janet, had died in a strange place far from her family, her friends and her community. That Campbell had shown no remorse or contrition that could have counted in his favour in consideration of the length of the sentence and that he took the life of a naive, middle-aged countrywoman who he manipulated and deceived. So, there you go, Islanders. What a fucking piece of shit. He couldn't afford the life he wanted by earning it himself, so he just used vulnerable women to either be the bankroll or to be part of his bullshit player life. And I could go on even more, but this would end up being multiple episodes. Just those women, they weren't the only ones he was involved with. But, look, I'm sure with the amount of detail I gave, you get the drift on what an arsehole this prick was. Now, parole comes up in 2034, but he's shown absolutely no remorse for what he's done, so I hope they never let him out. Condolences to Janet's family and friends and to all the women that were touched by him and that there were many more than made this episode. So, that's the end of another episode. Islanders, if you want to support the island, there are links in the description for Patreon, PayPal and merch. Please feel free to comment, like and subscribe and I would truly appreciate if you do share the channel. Hit the bell to be notified because, as you know, I don't believe the swearing out, say words like fuck and murder and the YouTube gods don't like that so I won't turn up in your channel, the promoted channels. So, your subscription and sharing are really appreciated in getting more people onto the island. Again, subscribe and comment on that 1,000 subscriber giveaway video for a chance to pick up a t-shirt. The winner will be chosen in a couple of weeks' time. Well, that's about it. I've been your host, Camber. You've been watching True Crime Island. And as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Good night and boom fucker